interesting that all three of these themes kind of come up in the passage that we're looking at today. It's a theme, it's the last one, it's about the passing of Sarah and death. And it's interesting how God uses the death of Sarah to bring about the first beginnings of a part of the promise that he had made to the Lord, to, to Abraham and to Sarah. It's a time when Abraham is old and you know, he's getting to the point that he's having to step aside. He's no longer a young, as young as he used to be and have the strength. And it is also a time that you, when you look at Abraham, you know, he's not a great man. He's not a big man in the terms of geopolitics. He's just a small person in a little area, in a backwoods area of the world. He wasn't in one of the big cities of, of the Mesopotamia and Babylon or any of those places, nor was he down in the Egyptian Nile Delta. He was just in an area, as we would call in this country, flyover country between the two, between the East Coast and the West Coast. It is interesting when you look through history, you find the same thing with Jesus. Jesus was not, you know, he was never a large person. He was just somebody on the fringe of the Roman Empire, at the border between the Roman Empire and the Parthian Empire, in a small state in Judea. And yet, God used the, both these men to accomplish great things. And so we begin and we look at this thing as we see how God typically works with small beginnings. And from those small beginnings, things grow. But let us look at this small beginning here in Genesis chapter 23. It's a very interesting passage. We, it's basically a passage where we see a negotiation, an ancient negotiation. And you wonder why is so much dedicated to this negotiation? We begin in Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, chapter 23, verse 1. And uh, we see that Sarah had lived 127 years. And these were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at Kirith Arba, which, that is at Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and weep for her. He evident the words here indicate that he went through the common practices of the time that they set up a tent for her body and he went in and he uh, cried there in front of the in front of her body. We not told for how long, but evidently during this time it came to his realization that he had no place to bury his beloved wife. So we're told in verse three that he rose up from before her, before the dead. And he evidently went to the Hittites. The Hittites evidently lived in this area or a group of Hittites. We know there were several different Hittite nations throughout the Middle East. The most famous one is the one that was one of the first civilizations that was actually up in the Turkish area, in the up around in, in Turkey, uh, near where Noah was, the Noah's Ark was landed. And they were one of the very first great civilizations even before Babylon. But these folks, they lived throughout this area of the world and had various groups that lived in different areas. And evidently there was a branch of them that lived in southern Palestine and controlled this area. And so he went to them and he said to them, I am a sojourner and a foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burial place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. So he comes to them and he says, I need a place to bury my wife. I need a place to bury her. And um, he says two things that are very interesting here. He approaches them and he points out to them that he's a sojourner and a foreigner. A sojourner today would be somebody who's a, who's a legal alien. It's somebody who's living here in the United States who has the papers to be living in here. They're permanent residents. They may even have a green card, but they're not a citizen of the United States. They have residency, but not a citizen. But then he pushes it a little further and he uses this word for foreigner, which also pushes it in the opposite direction as somebody who has no rights in the land. Somebody who is there without the proper documentation, but who's an outsider, a complete outsider. And he points this out. He says, I'm among you. 
But then he asked, can I have property where I can bury my dead? Where I can bury, give her a proper burial. Now the Hittites, it's interesting, they answered him and they said, hear us, my Lord. You are a prince of God among us. And the literal word is God among us, even though some take a honored prince and translate it different ways. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb to hinder you from burying your dead. And so they responded back. And basically what they're offering to Abraham, you know, we've recognized that God is with you, that you are a prince of God. God blesses you. And you can come and bury your dead in, uh, in our graves and become one of us. They're basically inviting him to enter in, not merely to be a person who lives near them, but to become part of their community. But then Abraham, we're told, he rose again there in verse 7 and bowed before the Hittite people, the people of the land. He was, showed great respect. And he said to them, if you are willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me Ephraim, the son of Zophar, that he may give me the cave of Machapella, which he owns. It is at the end of his field. The full price, let him give it to me in your presence as property for a burial place. Now, Abraham now says, I just don't want to bury my dead in your, in your area. I want to actually purchase land. I do not want to necessarily enter into your, become a member of your community, but I want to actually purchase property in your area to where I can bury the dead. And so then we find there, verse 10, that Ephraim was sitting among the Hittites. And Ephraim the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites. And all who went into the gate of his city. Now what you have to understand here is that Abram has traveled from where he has Sarah to the gate of the city. And in the ancient world, the city gate was where you negotiated contracts. It's where you held trials. Any public meeting was held at the city gate. When the scripture talks about the gates of hell not being able to withstand against us. It's basically saying the plans, the plots, the schemes of hell. It's not talking about a, uh, us sieging them or they're sieging us in that sense, but their plots and their plans. So even the devil's plans will not see to get, succeed against the believers. But here we're talking about the different, here Abram's at the place, he's doing a public negotiation for this property. He's negotiating for this contract in typical Near Eastern style or ancient style where you go through a whole bunch of uh, procedures. Uh, here in the States, if you want a house, you just talk to your realtor and you go see it. In the ancient world, in, 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 in the Near East, you, you have to find somebody who knows somebody who knows the community and then they say to the per and you send word through them and they say, I know somebody who's interested in your house. And you gradually negotiate. And the closer you get to contact with the person is the closer you get to an actual decision on whether to buy the house or not. But it's a very subtle and complicated social interaction that goes on. But here we see that process going on. And evidently Ephron was there in the city gate when, when Abram made his presentation. Maybe even Abram knew, knew that Ephron was there. So he gets up there in verse 11 and he says, No, my Lord, hear me, I give the field. Hear me, I give you the field. I give you the cave that is in it, in the sight of the sons of my people. I give it to you, bury your dead. Notice he said it three times, and he would give the land to Abraham. In the ancient world, uh, in a lot of places, you kind of learn that when somebody offers you something, the first offer is just polite. The second offer is, I'm considering it. It isn't until the time that it's offered a third time that it's a serious offer. Okay? Uh, the, you just When somebody says, I'll give you that car, the, they're just being polite. And so you have to understand, he is seriously offering to give this land to Abraham. 
But Abraham then looked and bowed down before the people of the land. Now to refuse this land, to refuse a gift that had been offered three times, could be considered an offense, could be considered an insult. But you know, as Abram bowed before the people of the land, and he said to Ephraim in the hearing of the people of the land, But if you will hear me, give me the price of the field. Accept it from me, that I may, buy, that I may bury my dead there. Abraham again assisted on paying the full price for it. Ephraim then answered Abraham and said, My Lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silvers. What is between you and me? Bury your dead. And Abram listened to Ephraim, and Abram weighed out for Ephraim the silver that he had na named in the hearing of the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver, according to the weights current among the merchants. So Ephraim threw out a price, 400 shekels of silver. Abraham had two choices before him. He could accept the free gift or he could pay for it. Abraham chose to pay for it. To understand how much he paid for it in our terms, a shekel was basically a day's labor. So if you were to go today on today's terms, and here in South Carolina, minimum wage is uh, $7.25. I was misinformed last night when I was working on this. And so that roughly works out to around $53 a day. And so when you may multiply that by 400, it comes around to $23,000. That's what he paid for the plot of land to bury his wife. Quite a high price for just a small plot of land. But that's what he paid. And then from there it goes and it tells us we have a summary there in the press of the passage beginning in verse 17 through 20. Telling us again that so the field of Ephraim in Machapella, which is to the east of Mara, the field with the cave and that it was in it and all the trees that were in the field throughout its whole area was made over to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites before all who went in at the gate of his city. After this, Abram buried his wife Sarah in the cave, in the field of Machapella, east of Merah, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave, that is in it, were made over to Abram as property for a burial place by the Hittites. Now there's several things going on here that are very interesting. You can do some cultural anthropology analysis, but for our purposes this day, the first thing that I want you to realize is this. We've already seen, finally, in the book of Genesis, part of Abram's promise, that God's promise to Abraham had partly been fulfilled in the birth of Isaac. And so you have the beginning of the fulfillment of a large nation already in start, starting. Now we are seeing the beginning of the promise of the land. Now it is interesting that this purchase of land God had promised the whole land of Canaan to, God, to Abraham and his descendants. But when Abraham died, the only piece of land that he owned was this. That's all he had. Could you imagine God has promised you this whole state of South Carolina and all you own is a burial plot? And we're you know, so you know, he, you know, he is, that's all it is. You know, he's beginning at this point that he is just a still an outsider, a foreigner, not a citizen of the area. In a lot of ways, the same thing is so for us. We are a citizen, a foreigner in this world. God has promised us the whole world. He's promised us all things, but we only have just a little. We have to wait for God to fulfill it, just as Abraham and his descendants had to wait. We find that uh, we, we, you know, these, this, we have to be careful with the entanglements in this world. You notice, Abe, they kept trying to offer him a position in their society. They kept trying to offer him what he needed, plus a status within their culture. 
that they would, he would become one of their actual princes, one of their actual leaders. They had been allied with him in the past, but now they were wanting him to incorporate himself with them. And he was refusing to do that. We as Christians have to be careful as we deal with the world. We are part in this world, but we're not part of it. And the world will oftentimes seek to offer us things to make us one of them, to try to yoke us to them. And we have to always remember that our ultimate status is that of the, we are citizens of the kingdom to come. We are children of God. And so therefore we should always avoid being so yoked and so dependent upon the things of this world that we are inexplicably mixed with their destiny, that our identity gets dissolved into the world's identity. We do not want to become molded to the way of the world's thinking. And so that at times means that we have to refuse certain good gifts that would be nice to receive and helpful. It may mean that we have to at times pay a higher price for things to maintain that godly integrity. After all, gifts are often are attached with strings, and we have to be careful about those strings. But there are times that in order to, remain, to maintain our testimony, we need to be willing to pay the high price. Where we stand firm on that which is godly and true. After all, many of our brethren in countries that are where there's great persecution, they can't go to college because they're a Christian. They pay a high price. They can't have the good jobs because they're a Christian. They pay a high price. How much are we willing to pay to maintain our Christian identity separate from the world? But the last thing that was back to this thing that I want us to remember. You know, this was a small beginning. This was the first piece of land that Abraham or any of his descendants actually owned in the Holy Land. And yet in time, God gave them the whole, all of it. It started out small, just a little bit, but God was in it. And through that, God worked a greater future. And though our work may seem small at times, if we are faithful to God and we're faithful in his purposes, God will do great things. And notice that God took a tragedy well, actually, in this case, part of the natural cycle of life, the death of Sarah after 127 years to begin fulfilling the promise of giving Abraham the land. So sometimes our life circumstances may be tragic, may be part of the natural cycle, but God even uses those simple and natural things to move his work forward. Therefore, let us always go about doing it in Christ, seeking to be faithful to him, seeking to honor him, and seeking to maintain our identity always in him.